Hello, gals, guys, or otherwise. Um, again, I'm going to continue to do this uh, intro until um, somebody says whether or not it is deemed offensive. I don't mean to be offensive to anybody, um, but I do want to kind of de uh, masculate my verbiage. Uh, uh, guys is a obviously um, predominantly, even though colloquially it is a phrase of, you know, hello everybody. Um, it's it's masculine in its roots, and uh, I kind of want to like you know do away with that do away with the gender specificness of my intro. So I like gals, guys, and otherwise. I think that one is kind of catchy. Anyway, we are here today. We're doing uh, our book study on uh, Saturdays. This is the Inner Temple of Witchcraft, and we're going to start with chapter one. I have done chapter one before, um, but then it, if you didn't watch yesterday's video um i did chapter one before and then coda got really sick and i had to uh put him down and yeah then covid really came into full swing where new jersey was going on lockdown so i had other things that i uh went ahead and spearheaded at the time that I, that needed to happen in my life and um didn't get through the entire book so my goal for 2020 of reading through all of Christopher Penzak's work has not come to fruition, but I do want to use it this year, and I do want to do that um, this year, at least uh, reading through the uh, the Inner Temple of Witchcraft. I think the Outer Temple of Witchcraft would be next. Um, as of December of next year, we will be to the... Uh, Temple of Shamanic Witchcraft, um, which is an interesting one in and of itself. I kind of like that one. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and delve into Chapter 1. Now, I have said in the past that I am not a fan of writing in my books, but as you can tell, I've kind of foregone that because writing down notes as I'm reading is really, um, shall we say, annoying as hell. Um, trying to say, okay, th this part here where he says this, this is what I agree with this on, and this is what I want to expand on that with. Yeah, a lot less writing whenever you actually do it in the book, and you're like, hey, touch on this. So anyway, we start chapter one. This is, uh, I'm reading out of, I don't know if there's a, let me go back. This is a first edition, seventh printing. Uh, it was released in 2009. Um, so, yeah, I want to draw attention to when this came out, in case something, uh, comes up where we need to discuss the time frame in which this book was written. Um, I don't really see this being a big issue, it's only, you know, going on 12 years old now, um, I don't see this being a big issue with this book, but I do want to draw attention to that. Um, also, I don't know if this book has been updated since then, if there's a new release that has come out. Uh, I don't think there has been, but I just want to draw attention where I'm reading my information from. You can pick this up off of Amazon, have it shipped right to you. Again, Inner Temple of Witchcraft. I may leave a link in the description below. I'm going to try to. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> Let's go ahead. I'm going to forego the introduction. Because, well, an introduction is just, hey, this is what this book is going to be about. That's what a common introduction is. I don't normally read introductions. Uh, but I want to get into chapter one here. So, chapter one is entitled, Ask a Witch. Um, and right off, we get into the question of, what is a witch? What is witchcraft? Um, these are two questions that don't have easy answers. The word witch is a very emotionally charged word, bringing up 
conflicting images across the centuries, it is hard to understand which image, if any, is correct. And I want to stress that this is an important um, this is important for anyone who takes the label of witch that they have to reconcile with themselves. So if you are taking up the mantle of witch, or you you are taking up the um, the label of witch, uh, even as warlock, if you choose that label, whatever label you choose, um, I, I want to stress, know exactly why you're choosing that and some of the things that come along with that, some of the negative connotations, some of the positive connotations that come along with the label that you choose. Uh, so I do want to stress that. Um, and then in the next paragraph, I want to unpack the fictionalizing that of what you fear. Um, and you see this with uh, propaganda cartoons and uh, the making of a serious matter, um, or the making fun of a serious matter, and how that desensitizes people. And I wanted to draw attention to that, um, that, you know, in, in the Western world, the word, the word witch evokes, um, the thought of an old hag with the poisoned apple, uh, brewing harmful potions and whatnot. It, the cartoons out there, the type of propaganda type stuff that has come out against witches uh, induces fear and it's a type of propaganda um, that ha is kind of similar to um, those of Nazi Germany maybe a less serious matter but still a serious matter of political cartoons um, in the United States with marijuana and being a Hispanic drug and the type of connotations that came along with that. So I want to draw attention to how whenever you fictionalize something or whenever you put something in a certain aspect, how it, um, it, induce, it starts to induce fear of that. It starts to it serves to make fun of, to stoke fear, and um, kind of be a call to action for those who have a certain agenda. Now, I'm not saying that the um, the witches of cartoons and whatnot that we grew up with, with Looney Tunes and whatnot, I'm not saying that those were purposely put there to instill fear, but that it is in fact also done that. Uh, there is a distinct difference, um, and I don't want to be blind to it, between, you know, having fun with something and being intentionally hurtful to a group of people. So I do want to stress that, that I am not blind to that at all, but that there is a definite uh, correlation that I see to that. And I mean, you can agree or disagree with me. Uh, and I know that these are sensitive topics that can come up whenever doing these um, readings and during this book club series. So, you know, do tell me if I, if I miss the mark completely, if I'm overreacting on something, or if I am at least close to something on there. Um, and maybe I've not, you know, fully, you know, gotten all the juice out of it. Um, I wanted to note, uh, in, on page eight, he says, some held the teachings of the wise women and cunning men of the tribes and knowledge of healing herbs, remedies, midwiving, and simple charms. And I wanted to really note that it's important to notice what they really were. Um, it was n most likely not a witch. Uh, rather, they were persecuted for the mere thought of something provoked by fear. These individuals during the, the burning times, 
were not necessarily witches. They were healers. They were your your pharmaceutical people. Uh, they were your doctors. They were, were your OBGYNs of those days. Um, they were the wise individuals that people sought counsel from. So they were quite literally like clergy. And it, it's important to note that these people were persecuted for that because of the fear of them being witches. So I did want to draw attention to that and, and pay honor to those people because they they got the short end of the stick. They really did. Um, he goes on to say um, in the next paragraph, this witch was rev revered as a healer, teacher, leader, and wise one. The image of the witch inspired the same reverence that a priest or minister does now in modern culture. For the ancestors of modern witchcraft were the priestesses and priests, the seers and advisors, living a spiritual life by turning into the f tuning, I'm sorry, by tuning into the forces of nature, the tides of the seasons and the cycles of the moon. They held a kinship, kinship with the plants and animals and in essence, all life. And I wanted to point out that the image of, of a witch has changed over the ages. And while many, if not all of these may apply, it is different for each person during different stages of our lives. So what I wanted to urge on there is, you know, during your, you know, teens and 20s, dur during your teens, you might be really into crystals and, you know, you may really be into a certain aspect. Uh, you might be into the seasons and as you go into your 20s, maybe you're more into divination and, you know, you deal more with tarot reading or oracle reading, rune reading, what have you. Um, and then whenever you get into your 30s, maybe you've matured a little bit. You look into the healing aspects. Um, and then maybe eventually whenever you get into your 60s, uh, or let's say in your 40s, you get more into the, the philosophical, the mythologies uh, and whatnot. You haven't really necessarily changed in your term of which, but you have expanded in who you are and whatnot. Maybe you haven't done all these things at the same time, but uh, in different stages of your life, maybe you resonate more with one thing or another. I know during my 20s, I was more uh, in tune with divination. I'm still in very in tune with divination, um, but it's gone a little less and the philosophy and theology and um, in the thought process behind the mythology has become a little bit more prevalent than it has in the past. So I wanted to kind of put a spotlight on that, that, you know, as we grow older, as we change, as we develop in our practice, that we will, um, most likely resonate with different parts of this uh, this term of which. Maybe you were a leader or a teacher at one time. Uh, maybe you were a healer at one time. And maybe you weren't all those things at the same time. And maybe you went from being a healer to maybe leading a small group to being a teacher of a large group to being a wise one that, you know, you've taught the teachers and now you're the wise one that sits back and, and says, you know, this is, this is going good. I'm going to step back a little bit. And it's important to note that you don't have to be all those things at once, but most likely you're going to touch on those things one at a time at certain points in your life. And if you don't hit all of them, that's fine. Uh, not everybody is called to be a healer. I certainly have not been called to be a healer uh, in the physical sense. That's for darn sure. Um, you know, I 
I do some stuff here and there for myself uh, and for people around me, but I have not necessarily been called, at least not yet in my life, to be somebody that practices Reiki. So I, I want to kind of draw notice to that. And then we're going to go on. I'm going to try to just highlight some of these areas here. I'm not going to go through and uh, hit a point on each paragraph. Let me have a drink from my Ratatouille mug. Mm. French vanilla cappuccino. Mm. Yeah, Keurig's best. Um, actually, I think they're like great value. They're like off-brand. Anyway, in the next paragraph, like I said, I'm not going to go through every single paragraph on this one. Um, and I probably won't do that in every chapter. So, you know, this is just to highlight my takeaways from each chapter. Uh, but in the next paragraph, he says, Male witches are not called warlocks. The word warlock can be traced from Scottish, Old English, Germanic, and Indo-European roots and is now generally regarded to mean deceiver or oathbreaker. To those involved in the craft, such a title was probably associated by witchcraft by those who wanted to defame the practice. <clears throat> now, while I think this term is true as far as the reasoning and yes um the lighting in here i have a slip of light coming through maybe like do that maybe that'll work okay um because this is at three o'clock in the e uh, afternoon and it's starting to go sunset so we're gonna get some of those really nice colors coming through anyway um, while some of this is probably true, um, I have heard it that, uh, it is thought that the, the term of oath break, oath breaker was to the church. And there are actually some people out there that are reclaiming this because they're like, yeah, I'm an oath breaker to the church. And it was given mostly to men because women weren't seen as being able to really, pledge an oath to the church and therefore they couldn't really break an oath to the church they were just witches and men were called warlocks because they could go into an oath and hence break it um i don't know how true that is um but it does seem to coincide and i do know that there are some people out there that are reclaiming this word warlock for a male witch um, I'm not one of them. I'm okay being a witch. Uh, I don't necessarily want to be called a warlock. Not something that I've ever really thought was a thing for me. <laughs> so, I'm okay just being a witch. And taking up the, um, the negative and positive, uh, connotations that come with that. Um, down at the bottom of the, of page nine, if you are not to not sure what to call someone, ask them or see how they refer to themselves. And I wanted to point out that this is not just important for religious or a practice, uh, practitioner's label. This is something that is and should be common for people with pronouns. I know I slip and I call people he, she, and whenever they go by they, and I'm trying to fix that. It's something that is, and I know it is, a blind spot. I'm trying to, you know, rectify that in my own brain thing. Uh, my brain doesn't always work at the top notch, but I try my best. And at least try to give me points for trying, please. Trying to get better. Anyway, we're going to turn the page there and move on. I, I wanted to... <clears throat> point out at the top of page 10 uh, of what he says about the Cabot tradition. And this is the definition that they gave as witchcraft at the time. Witchcraft is an art, science, and religion. A witch is one who lives the art, science, and religion of witchcraft. And I just wanted to 
say that I like it. I like that definition. I think it's a good definition. Um, I think there are points to kind of uh, that that can be tweaked, and it's okay um, to tweak that. But I think that is a a good way to go about uh, defining yourself. If you need like the little five second you know, introduction, uh, or the five second explanation of, well, what's a witch? A witch is someone who lives the art, science, and religion of witchcraft. And, uh, we're, we're gonna see how he adapts that later. At the bottom, whenever, whenever he's talking about the, the art, I really love how he describes this. Witchcraft is an art. It is a system based on the cycles of life. And then goes further down. He says, even though two witches can say the same exact words of a spell, each does it differently. Each brings his or her or they uh, or their own personal nuances, intentions, and inflections. More often than not, witches would probably write their own spells, creating a personal tradition. Each witch works with the same principles based on the science of witchcraft, but they express it quite differently, evaluating the craft to a very beautiful art form. The poetry of magic can bring a tear to the eye and evoke our highest emotions. Song, chant, drumming, instruments, poetry, and drama are used in ritual whatever the creative expression, no one can doubt that witchcraft is a form of art once they experience it. And I really love that definition. I think it kind of encapsulates, you know, during ritual, especially during ritual, you have people that can say the exact same thing and it is completely different of an experience for each one of them. Um, they can say the same thing. They have, they may have different movements. They have different inflections on it. They have different ways that they, they sing or dance it. And I think that's wonderful. And I think that's important to note that this is a form of art. Um, so next time you're in ritual, just know that you're an artist. And I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, not that you need my approval, but I appreciate it. Moving on. He says in the uh, the section on spirituality, in the threefold definition, he, he says, in fact, uh, it is called the old religion, for many trace their traditions roots back to early Mother Earth goddess cults of the Paleolithic period. I say slightly uh, disagree on this, and that's because not everybody does. And even though he says many, I hate even the uh, the term of many in this instance because while we, as witches, may say that you know this this tradition goes back ages and ages, for many of us, it's fairly new in the way that we're we're actually conducting ourselves in it. Um, maybe the roots of the overall belief is older than we think, but in, in the vast majority of what we believe and what we practice, for many of us, I do want to say, is probably a lot newer than what we think. And that's okay. That doesn't demean uh, the practice that they are practicing. It's not. It's not to demean it at all. I think it's wonderful and it's beautiful in the way that it's developed and structured and whatnot. Um, and yes, there are things that you can find that are uh, connected to older forms of paganism that date back, you know, millennia, and. Yes, I'm not going to deny that, but I, I kind of disagree that, uh, 
it you know in it being called the old religion because it goes that far back for many uh many traditions and all that um the roots you know at, at their bare bare basics maybe but for the vast majority i'd say that for the vast majority of the people out there their practices are a little bit more modern than what um than what we've been told or what we realize um so yeah uh, i i kind of bump on that just because of the the historical value of it um we don't always know because there are so many records out there that have been discarded or burned and and out of this fear and propaganda of the witch being bad. So we don't really know everything about it. Um, but I think at the very, very core of the goddess traditions and whatnot, yes, there is old roots there. But I think the majority of the practice other than that is a little bit more modern and I could totally be wrong on this and that's okay um, it's that I just kind of disagree on a little bit of that um, and I wanted to note a couple sentences after that the word religion can conjure up some discomfort in those who are seeking witchcraft as an alternative to the more dogmatic excuse me, religions. Mm. And I say so true. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, the term religion can conjure up some very harsh feelings for people. Um, whenever they think religion, they think of, you know, Christianity, big church, or uh, a synagogue, a temple of some sort, and having to go to that place, you know, you know on a regular basis and pay penance or um, do some sort of ritual act of, you know, purification in order to not go to a good or bad place or whatnot, that is, you know, drummed in us that that is what religion is. And yeah, I, I think a lot of people have that, that negative connotation to the word religion because of the negative things that have happened from those, uh, situations. So I think, yes, the word religion is not exactly the most comfortable word. Um, so he goes on to say, when I say witchcraft is, uh, because he mentions uh, spirituality uh, rather than the word of religion. He says, when I say witchcraft is spirituality, I mean um, it is a spiritual path. You walk it for nourishment of the soul, to commune with the life force of the universe, and to thereby better know your own life. And I, I said, I will, and I have a note here. I like that there's an explanation to the definition. The clarification is important. Whenever you're talking about, uh, in your practice, or even in, whenever you're writing a book, it is important to put in there, hey, um, this the word spirituality to me means this i think having a definition there of what spirituality means to christopher penzak in this moment of time is an important thing to to note especially if it's going to be something that we're studying later on or even in just this chapter i haven't read through the entire book so i'm only going by chapter by chapter um but i think it is important to note what his definition is of spirituality in this instance and how he means it to be interpreted. So, uh, he goes on to say, uh, people do not realize that witchcraft is a daily commitment to review or to renew yourself in the cycles of the earth, to synchronize yourself with the powers of life is the path to enlightenment. It, it is a path to enlightenment. I'm sorry. Living life as a witch is no easy task. 
absolutely true. You will meet people um, who, you know, they hear the word witch and they're immediately taken back. That, you know, again, we go back to the propaganda and the way that the witches have been viewed or um, associated in our culture. So it is no easy task. And, you know, it, it is a daily commitment to renewing yourself, um, to notice the, the cycles of the earth and synchroni synchronize yourself with the powers of life. And, yeah, it is a path to a path to enlightenment. So, yeah, I, I really agree with that. Uh, with those two sentences there. And uh, I just want to make note of them. Um, moving on. Um, in the next paragraph, he says, First, it is a nature-based spiritual practice. Divinity in all things is recognized, from the land, water, and sky, to planets, animals, and people. All material things are seen as an expression of life as the divine, Witches are often involved in environmental reforms and animal rights groups because of this belief. I wanted to stress on this by saying many, but not all, but I'd like to steer clear of absolutes. Yeah, I'm trying to read my, my little cursive scribbles in, in the margins there as I went. Uh, again, I like to stay away from absolutes. This is a many, but not all, um, you know... It, and I kind of wanted to kind of just, you know, poke that bear. Because I, I don't like to say that all are. I, I don't even like to say many are, but there's not really a word um, of, you know, less than many, but more than some. You know, and if there is, I'm not thinking about it, or I'm not thinking of it. Uh, so... Uh, this is another one I have in the same, uh, with the same comment on there. Witches are polytheistic, meaning we worship more than one deity. We recognize the spirit of life running through all things, but believe it expresses itself through a multitude of faces. Again, many, mm, not all, absolutely not all, um, but even many is a little bit of a stretch. I mean, you have hard polytheists and soft polytheists and... You have people that, you know, do witchcraft just for the magic aspect, and they are pure scientists with it. You have agnostic uh, witches out there. You have atheist witches out there. Uh, you have people that are, for lack of a better term, monotheistic. They know that there are other deities out there, but they only work with one. So are they polytheistic still? I, you know, it, it's one of those things. Uh, so you can't really even say that there's an absolute there uh, whenever it comes to witches. Not all witches even have deity figures in their practice, and that's okay. And I'm going to say that in, you know, for a, a while here. That's okay. <laughs> uh, and again, another many but not all. Uh, witches focus on divinity in the form of male and female energies, gods, and goddesses. Again, Many, not all. Um, on page 12, um, in the continuing paragraph there, the goddess's energy is vast, portrayed as, as loving, kind, and life-giving at certain times, while dark, warrior-like, and vengeful at others. Again, a common view. And he goes on to say about the god aspect. Uh, he is a warrior and protector, king and judge. The god can reveal the secrets of magic and illumination or surround you with darkness to force you to face yourself. I think these are both accurate descriptions of many god and goddess deity figures out there. And I want to go back on to Christopher Penzak himself um, in the Cabot tradition. It is a, I believe, a Wiccan, uh, a traditional w Wiccan practice, uh, or that's what it's based on. So I want to, you know, also go back to this is 
his view because this is the tradition that he is in and this is the tradition that he is explaining and i do want to note that uh this isn't necessarily a book for all witches because you can't ever write a book for all witches because all witches aren't the same um this is him uh, describing his tradition uh, and his practice and the tradition that he's actually um, pretty much developed uh, through the Temple of Witchcraft series. So let's move on to the next paragraph, the first sentence here. From these two beings spring all deities in or of myth. And in my practice, uh, I have one a noble deity, uh, and you know that um, it, it's part of Gnostic beliefs, and uh, I'm actually looking more and more into Gnosticism, Gnosticism, and um, you know, loving every minute of it. I'm telling you, but in in that aspect, we don't have two beings that have created everything else. We have one being that created multiple um, aeons, deity figures, who have also created sub-deity figures, such as the Demiurge, um, the, uh, the god of the Old Testament, uh, is how it's viewed. And I'll go more into that, um, on, I believe Sunday I have it marked for, yes, no, 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 not this Sunday, next Sunday. Um, because even though I'm still a little bit fuzzy on some of the down and dirty details of it, I do like that, that creation story, and I do vibe with it very much. So, we're going to go down another paragraph. At the bottom of page 12, in psychological terms, we call these common visions archetypes. Archetypes are primal images that can be found across different cultures. Going on to the following sentence, psychologist Carl Jung uh, popularized the term archetype, but they existed far before his identification. And I like to give a nod to Carl Jung. I think it is very important that we do talk about archetypes. We're going to be talking about archetypes in the uh, in the tarot series we're going to be you're going to see archetypes coming up a lot this year um in the way that we talk about tarot and uh oracles and whatnot and even whenever we talk about um working with deity and working with uh different energies and whatnot working with archetypal figures so i like that the term archetypes is introduced page 12 very early on in this book and in this series. So I think that is a, uh, a definite thing that needs to be acknowledged early on what an archetype is and how it is viewed or how these deities are viewed as archetypes and this these archetypal energies. So... At the top of page 13, I wanted to, uh, I have underlined here, see, I stopped actually taking notes in the, in the margins a little bit here and there. I'm like, oh, oh, I like this. And like, as I was reading, I'm like, I don't want to stop. I just want to underline. So I didn't, I don't have notes for all of these. Um, but I did underline the sentence. The common belief is that archetypes are primal beings uh, of an almost unknowable nature but they express themselves through god forms, the individual descriptions and personalities of the gods of myth. The god forms act like a mask. And I like this explanation. It's a very, um, very easy explanation to get your, your head around, um, that these are primal beings or th these are primal energies, if you want to see them as energies. Um, you know, uh, of an unknowable nature. 
and they express themselves in different ways. Um, the archetype of um, of a protector may come in the form of a god or a goddess, you know, depending on who you are and how you best receive that. And I think that's important to note here that archetypes take these images up. Uh, they may just be genderless energies and forces and and they portray themselves as uh, one gender or another because of one person or another. And uh, I think that's important to note and important to philosophize about and think about. And then he goes on, this is at the, uh, also um, towards the top of page 13. Most mainstream religions, particularly the Judeo-Christian traditions, are monotheistic. True. Uh, acknowledging only one God, theirs. Some feel these traditions focused on the masculine vibration of the divine and sought it as the one and only source of life. Also true. Um, in our diamond analogy, and I didn't touch on the diamond analogy, but basically there are different facets to people, um, different facets to deity. And if we look at, um, at a deity in all facets, you know, we get different aspects from the same deity figure. Um, so moving on in our diamond analogy. They are looking at the brilliance of the whole diamond, but are blinded to look at the individual facets. Or they are fascinated by one facet of the diamond, one god, and exclude all else. And I really like this explanation um, of how certain people who happen to be narrow-minded uh, in their religious aspects tend to think or how they are coming to these conclusions that this is a one and only God uh, of forever and ever and that's it no no changing minds or anything like that um, I, I did want to kind of read that because I think it kind of hits a um, it, it, it hits the nail on the head on that one at the bottom of that paragraph, he writes, As we look at the great spirit at the center of the diamond, which is, remember that we, too, are facets of the diamond, like the trees, oceans, and animals, we are expressions of the divine, the goddess, God, the great sp and great spirit. I just love the wording of that. Um, how you have the great spirit. And we are not only seeing the diamond, we are part of the diamond. The diamond is part of us and we're all connected. Um, so I think that's important to, um, to read that. It's a very beautiful, beautifully written phrase um, there. So yeah, kind of love it. Excuse me, I have an itchy nose. Anyway, moving on down to the healer as uh, the healer area. Modern medicine is wonderful in many ways, but in these ancient times, healing was a process involving the mind, emotions, and spirit as well as the body. And I think that is the whole body approach or the whole um, the holistic approach that many people. Uh, need that the medical community is not giving. Um, you have things involving the mind. You have things that are involving emotions. You have things that are involving, uh, you know, the physical body and the spiritual aspects and whatnot. But I don't think medicine really recognizes that entirely. And I really wish it did. A healer he goes on to say, um, was one to counsel, advise, and minister to the spiritual balance of the individual or tribe, as well as do ritual, divination, and hands-on healing. And I, I kind of love that. That 
the counselor, the advisors, the um, the people who were ministering as um, as people of paganism and saying ministering not just in the Christian sense were seen as healers and that they were people that were you know going out because they were called to heal people um in a spiritual way and i think it's quite beautiful and they they would also do they would do hands-on healing um but they they were trying to balance the spiritual aspect and to heal that um for the individual or the or as he says here the tribe and and there were multiple aspects um that he would do like the ritual uh divination uh, or just hands-on healing i think that's important to tip the hat to anybody who is doing any one of those things in order to help out a community in order to be a minister of um whatever their practice is that it, it's not an easy undertaking it sometimes can be very daunting um and uh yeah hats off to you i try to do that i'm not as involved as i wish i could be but i try i try a little bit um on page 14 we're talking about the uh the walker and he says, a witch is a walker between the worlds. And I think this is so true um, for those who are involved in, in especially in magical practitioners, um, not just um, people who are pagan. Uh, you have some people out there that are pagan and they just, they go by the, the writings, the teachings, and that's it, you know. They're not ones for meditation. They're not ones for ritual aspects. They like the mythology. And that is what they are about. That's who they are. And whatnot. So, um, I think for a vast majority of people that probably watch this channel, this would ring true. That you are a walker between worlds. We, When we meditate, we go to a different a uh, place, a different time, uh, a place outside of time to connect with deity. And um, I know with me connecting with the dead and trying to help them along as well as, you know, trying to comfort those, are, you know, that are mourning this dead person. You know, in those aspects, you do walk in two different worlds. Uh, anybody out there who uh, practices their psychic abilities um, will also know this. You know, there are times whenever you are fully a walker of worlds. You know, you are straddling the fence between two different uh, worlds completely. It's not always easy. So... You know, you can call yourself a walker instead of a witch, and you're still correct. Um, but moving down the the page here, many people associate the word shaman with a medicine man of the tribal of tri a tribal people. Shamans are spiritual leaders, but that is not the entire picture. I think this is important to note. Um, and he goes on to to talk about shamans and i'm probably going to talk more about shamans whenever we get into the temple of shamanic witchcraft so by the end of the year uh the shaman believes in non-physical spiritual realms and learns to send his or her spirit to such realms in these world to such realms in these worlds one can retrieve information and healing energy and commune with spirits the shaman ministers to his or her people through the through this ability to affect healing of the mind, body, and spirit. Wonderful definition of how the shaman is a walker. You know, the walker of worlds, the one that straddles between two different worlds. Um, 
And he goes on to say in the next paragraph, witches hone their abilities to pierce the veil and travel to these dimensions where they speak with goddesses, gods, and spirits. Like the shamans, they are expected to remain ground in the material world with responsibilities to their people, yet keep one foot ever ready to enter the spiritual world. Not always an easy task. Uh, that's me talking there. He goes on to say, they are bridges between the worlds seeking to bring their people into greater partnership with the divine. And I really love the way he portrays this, the way he says this. I think it is very nice. It's very eloquently, eloquently, eloquently uh, said or written. And I think it's important to note that if you are going into a uh, tradition of witchcraft, um, you know, these are things that you may end up doing, and these are things that you may be interested in doing if you're not doing them already. Um, and these are things that we're going to be going into with the inner temple of witchcraft. Um, <clears throat> Moving on to page 15, and I'm going to start wrapping it up here because after this page, we're all done uh, with chapter number one. I'm going to try to get it in as quickly as possible because I don't want this video to be incredibly long. Hopefully, I can keep all of our uh, our book study sessions to an hour or less. Let's see. Anyway, chapter or page 15 here. The most important aspect of this tradition is the individual's sovereignty. Each practitioner is his or own priest or priestess. Teachers, elders, and healers are respected, and they can help you in your pa on the path. But ultimately, witchcraft is about your own personal, individual relationship with the divine. Love this. Goes on to say, through such, through such training. You have the ability to perform your own spiritual rituals and seek guidance. I love how he says this. This is almost like a warning label of, you know, if you are not sure about this, this is what it's going to entail. And it's very straightforward. Um, he goes on to say here, we have the last word on what is correct and good for us as well as the responsibility of living with those decisions. So basically, it, what he is saying in this one paragraph, and I think this is such a powerful paragraph um, to look at if you're thinking of just now coming into witchcraft, that, I'm bring out my, my drawer here so I can set the book down, that if you're thinking about coming into the practice of witchcraft, that this is what it's going to entail, you are going to be uh, responsible for your decisions. There is no, the devil made me do it, um, you know, type of defense here. There is no, um, you know, the God, uh, you know, God had other plans. No, this is, you take responsibility for you. And it is very straightforward, very upfront, and almost like a warning label of, if you don't agree to these terms as a practitioner of witchcraft, you probably shouldn't be getting any further than this chapter one. Uh, and I think that's important to know. So he goes on to, into the next paragraph. He talks about a friend of hers, or a friend of his that uh, she didn't like, um, she didn't claim the word witch as her own, and that was fine with me. And what I have to say on this is labels are for soup cans. If you don't want the word witch as your term, that's fine. You know, you don't have to have any term at all. Uh, labels are for soup cans. If you want to take up the word witch as a, you know, quick and easy label that works for you, fantastic, great, good on you. But you don't have to. Moving on to page 16, this is about halfway down the page. Um, he says, nothing is prevented or forbidden. The path of the witch is truly the path of knowledge 
and more importantly, wisdom. It changes and adapts as new information is discovered. Witchcraft is a living religion. And I think that's important, uh, an important takeaway that we're not stagnant as practice, practitioners of witchcraft, as witches. Um, and, and even if you don't claim the term of witch, that I think. I want to hit home that it's important that you don't, you know, stagnate yourself with the term uh, or with with certain dogmatic ways that you can and allow yourself to adapt whenever new information is discovered, whenever anything's unearthed, if it changes something about what you believe, if it contradicts something that you believe, it's okay to acknowledge that. And it's okay to not be afraid of changing your viewpoint on your on your practice, on your faith, on your on your uh, on what you believe. It's okay to change that. It's okay. Uh, towards the bottom here, uh, he has some takeaways, uh, takeaway questions uh, for the reader. What is witchcraft? What is a witch? And most importantly, what does it mean to become a witch? And I offer these three questions to you to journal about uh, until next week. Whenever we pick up at chapter two, uh, maybe journal about these in your book of mirrors, book of shadows, if you have just a plain old journal that you like to keep. These are questions that should be answered if you are a practitioner of witchcraft. And I like to actually go back and answer these questions for myself uh, over the period of time, because sometimes those definitions do change for us. So those questions again are, what is, a, what is witchcraft? What is a witch? And most importantly, what does it mean to become a witch? So I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go and ruminate on that. Um, join me tomorrow for Crystal Pagan for the Crystal Paganism series, and I will talk to you guys then. We're discussing Epiphany, and uh, I will catch you guys then. So until then, may you guys have love, hugs, and ladybugs. Bye bye.